thanks to the Center for Critical Thinking for inviting me to speak. The invitation came through member Larry Siegel, who was a colleague and mentor of mine way back when we taught at the University of Nebraska in the 1980s. So good to hear from you, Larry, and thank you for the invitation. I'm gonna be presenting today on implicit bias training for law enforcement. And before I disappear behind my PowerPoint, I'm gonna tell you who I am and what led me to the development of this training program. It's called Fair and Impartial Policing. So mostly I've been an academic, uh, University of Nebraska, my first academic job. That was too cold, so I went to Florida State University. Um, then I went to PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum in Washington, DC, a nonprofit think tank dedicated to improving policing, and then came to University of South Florida in Tampa, where I am currently. And it's when I was at PERV that I started thinking about the issue of bias policing. And I went through, I had to educate myself on the issue and came to believe two things that didn't go together in my head. And one was that bias in policing was more pervasive than just a few bad apples on a few calls. I came to believe that bias policing was more widespread. But I also came to know and have had reinforced for me every day since, most cops are well-intentioned people who wanna serve their communities. And I couldn't figure out how both of those things could be true until I was introduced to the science of implicit bias. Now, keep in mind, this was back in 2004, before implicit bias was the household phrase that it is now. Um, and ultimately, that education led me to produce the training program, FIP. Um, and what we're trying to do is this, help police recognize the biases that they may not know they have, provide them with skills, techniques for addressing those human biases, for producing impartial policing, but then also to produce the motivation to use those skills and techniques. So let me go to the PowerPoint. And share my um, agenda with you. So I'm going to talk about the science of implicit bias, but I'm assuming a fairly educated audience, but I'll talk about several types and I pick some studies that I thought might be interesting. Then I'll turn to the fair and impartial policing training program. What is our key content? Um, why do we have variations across segments? We have different versions for patrol officers, supervisors, on up to command. Um, I'll share some of the skills that we uh, share with cops and in so doing, share skills with you that you can implement to address your own human biases. And then finally, fact and fiction about implicit biases and about implicit bias training, IBT. This comes from this interesting summer of 2020, um, where there's been a discussion of many things, including police reform and um, lots of commentary, some fact, some fiction. So let's distinguish between the two. So on to the science of implicit bias. And I'm going to distinguish between our traditional notions of bias and prejudice and implicit bias. Um, and in fact, for many years, the social psychologists, these are mostly in university and college settings, um, when they told us about bias and prejudice, they assumed it came in just one form. And that's the traditional form. And that is, involves people who have animus and hostility towards certain groups. And these people with animus and hostility have stereotypes, negative stereotypes about these groups. And those stereotypes impact on that person's perceptions and can impact on their behavior, producing discriminatory behavior. With these traditional notions of bias and prejudice, the person is conscious of these stereotypes and this animus and unconcerned about the discriminatory behavior that it produces. By accident, the social psychologists discovered implicit bias. In fact, they had been measuring the traditional biases and, and time went on and they were still seeing discrimination in society, but people were um, measuring as less prejudice. And they assumed that it had to do with the social desirability of not appearing prejudiced so they attempted to come up with more unobtrusive measures, 
for measuring traditional bias. And it was in that context that they discovered implicit bias. Because with implicit bias, we still link groups to various stereotypes, but it's not based on animus and hostility towards those groups. Those stereotypes can impact our perceptions and impact our behavior, producing discriminatory behavior. But those implicit biases can impact us outside of conscious awareness, such that they're not aware of them and we're not uh, aware that we are in fact discriminating. And the really bad news for everyone watching this presentation, this occurs even in individuals who at the conscious level reject biases, stereotypes, and prejudice. Even well-intentioned people, even well-intentioned cops have biases that can impact perceptions. So three types of implicit biases that I'll talk about. I read somewhere there's 73, but I'll spare you. Implicit associations, attention bias, and the we, they bias. So implicit associations is basically what I've been talking about. We link groups to various um, characteristics or stereotypes. Um, those groups might be based on their race and ethnicity, English language ability, age, profession. Think about the stereotypes associated with police body shape, attractiveness, dress. The stereotypes could be positive or negative. We, maybe we think that group is intelligent or criminal, family oriented, good drivers, poor drivers, truthful, industrious, lazy. Now, when we're sharing with police, we focus in on a subset of studies because there's been a lot of research, you know, what are the groups that we stereotype and what are the stereotypes we link to them? This subset examines the association in many people's heads between African-Americans and crime and or threat. Um, number of studies looking at this, I'm sharing the race and weapons slash tool study. And here the um, subjects are in a laboratory and they're looking at a computer screen. And the researchers, we're gonna flash up pictures of black or, or white male faces, followed very quickly by pictures of either a weapon or a tool. And the subjects are told, when you see the faces, don't do anything. But when you see the picture afterwards, hit this key if you see a weapon and this key if you hit a tool. Now this is gonna happen very quickly because we're trying to tap into their fast thinking. Um, so hit this key if it's a weapon, this key if it's a tool very quickly. Now the question the researchers were trying to ask, does the race of the person in the previous picture impact on the person's ability to correctly identify weapon or tool? Does the race impact their identification of weapon or tool? And the answer was yes. After seeing a black face, subjects were more likely to erroneously identify a tool as a weapon, as something posing a threat. Clearly this has implications for real life, particularly in the life of an officer. So we share studies in our training, but we also make this very important point that implicit associations can be based at least in part on fact. You know, case in point, my best friend Mark is a gay male and he loves Broadway musicals and he can cook and he can decorate. And on a color wheel, Mark can identify five colors between red and burgundy. Aren't those all stereotypes of a gay male? Because indeed implicit associations can be based in part on fact. And this is true of what we were just talking about, the race crime link. Criminological research has shown people of color are disproportionately represented among people involved in street crime. Now, we certainly looked into that in depth and let me back up and explain what we've come to understand. A, we know that lower income people are disproportionately represented among those who commit street crimes. B, we know that people of color are disproportionately represented in lower income levels. And that has helped us understand A plus B equals C, my original statement, people of color are disproportionately represented among people who commit street crime. It's not a race causal factor, it's an income intervening variable, if you will. So we share that, but of course that has to be followed with this important caveat. 
just because stereotypes are based in part on fact does not justify treating an individual as if he or she fits the group stereotype. Most Muslims are not terrorists. Most black people do not commit crime. Most men do not commit crime. Most poor people do not commit crime. We can recognize the fact at the basis of some stereotypes and still know we err when we treat the individual as if they fit the stereotype. We tell the police, policing based on your stereotypes is gonna make you ineffective, unsafe, as well as unjust. Now, this is a very important crux of our training. And I usually ask the room, are you with me on this? Because this is important. And, and one guy said, no, I'm not with you. He said, I'm gonna go with probabilities. So this was actually at a command level training of a major US agency. And he said, no, I'm gonna go with probabilities. And what he meant was, hey, if such and such group is disproportionately involved in crime, I plan on treating them that way. I'm gonna approach them that way. And I'm collecting my thoughts and I'm about to walk over and engage in a very non-combative, you know, open way. But instead, his colleague across the room spoke up. And this was an African-American colleague. And he said, that's me. That's me off duty that you are treating like a criminal when you go with probability. I didn't have to say a word. So what are the implications? What might implicit bias look like in law enforcement? Maybe an officer is undervigilant with whites, Asians, women, the elderly. Maybe the officer interprets ambiguous behavior on the part of blacks and Hispanics as more threatening, that furtive movement. Maybe he dismisses information from an informant if the information is not consistent with his preconceived notions about groups. We have a two car crash and two different stories. Maybe the officer believes the man in the BMW in a tie, as opposed to the young kid in the 1983 Corolla. But let me go back to the first one. Cause again, one of the things we say is policing based on stereotypes might make you unsafe. Story, um, Las Vegas lost two officers who were slain while eating pizza for lunch. This was in 2014. We were actually training in Las Vegas about four weeks after that. And we got to the slide that says policing based on stereotypes can make officers unsafe. And one of the officers in the classroom told his story. He was one of the officers on duty on that day. And they knew very quickly, they had two slain colleagues. They did not know by whom, they did not know where the perpetrator had gone, but then they had a report of a killing or shooting at a civilian in a local Walmart nearby. And that is where they deployed. And that is where our officer was on that day. Now he has subsequently picked up his story on the radio and I'm gonna let him finish. The class also made him reassess something that happened to him that's now legend at the department. It actually happened a month before he took the training, and it was horrible. Last June, on a Sunday morning, two of Brett's fellow officers were shot to death in a pizza place on the north side of the city. Brett responded to the scene not long after. The other customers, of course, were freaking out, yelling, he went that way, he went that way, meaning the shooter. Brett figured it might be a revenge killing of some sort either against cops in general or these two officers in specific. In that area, I mean, it's a high gang environment. There's a lot of gang members there. And um, did you think male, female, black, white, anything like that? Male, probably black or Hispanic. I mean, northeast area part of Las Vegas, it's a large black and Hispanic population. Um, so, you know, you you go with the odds. Brett takes off on foot in the direction everyone's pointing and eventually ends up at a Walmart. Customers, employees, everyone is flooding out of the store, screaming. So now, this isn't just an isolated shooting of two cops. This is an active shooter in a crowded public place. And at this point, the color of the suspect in Brett's mind changes from black or Hispanic to white. Brett knows about active shooter situations. He trains other officers in how to deal with these cases. Columbine, Aurora, Sandy Hook... When Brett thinks active shooter, he thinks young white male. 
The whole story is too long to tell here, but in short, Brett ultimately finds himself in an empty Walmart getting ready to ambush the gunman in the automotive section. It's a young white male, semi-automatic pistol in his hand. He doesn't see Brett. And I start to make my final turn to get a good angle on him. And I come almost face to face with a female, probably four or five feet away. And keep in mind, all this now is happening in fractions of a second. But my first thought is, why is she in here? And then I look more at her and I'm like, she's not a victim, she's not a customer. She wants to be exactly where she is right now. In all the commotion, people yelling and pointing and telling Brett where the shooter was, no one ever mentioned there were two of them. Brett and the woman exchanged gunfire from four or five feet away. Miraculously, she missed him. Brett hit her in the shoulder. He ran out of the store and let another team of officers take over. After a firefight, the male shooter was dead. His wife shot herself in the head. So this was what was on Brett's mind when he went into the implicit bias training class a month later. When they started to explain that these biases aren't based on being racist, they're not based on being sexist, they're just based on our experience, I was like, oh my gosh, I've been teaching this for years. Active shooters are white guys. Active shooters, when we role play, are white officers that act as the suspect. We never throw a female in the mix. So I had that aha moment, wow, that's what happened to me. I thought that this woman wasn't going to be a threat to me and let her remain as she was a little bit longer than I probably should have. It was like a... Excuse me. Policing based on stereotypes can be unsafe. So attentional bias, you've probably heard of this. It's a whole arena in social psychology. Whom do we look at first, listen to first, pay attention to the uh, longest. And this study I want to share, oh, and implicit associations, important point, can impact on our attention, where our attention goes. This particular study comes out of education. It is um, elementary school teachers are the subjects and they're brought into a laboratory and they're told, we're going to have you watch various video segments. And in each segment, you're going to see multiple children in a classroom engaged in activities. And you're going to see several of these. And what we'd like you to do is watch out for developing misbehavior. We know that teachers are really good at figuring out when misbehavior is about to bubble up. And that's what we want you to do. Well, in fact, no misbehavior occurred. But what the researchers were doing was tracking the teacher's eye movements to see based on these instructions where their attention was for this task. And in fact, it was on black men. Um, So you can see also how this could have great ramifications for police, where is their attention going and how do their implicit associations impact on what they're paying attention to? Because keeping in mind, when you're paying attention over here, you could be missing something very important over there. Here's a law enforcement example. This came from one of my own uh, fair and impartial policing trainers. And his police department would assist uh, school security at the local high school, specifically standing at the metal detectors. And he said, you know, the metal detector would beep now and again for a male in a hoodie. Well, if that male in the hoodie fit the, you know, thug stereotype, whatever that is in your head, that person would be pulled out and extensively screened. But if it beeped for someone in a hoodie that didn't fit the thug profile, they would just be waved through, even though there was a beep. And so, you know, ultimately the kids figured this out. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure the non-threatening kids um, carry the weapons into the school because they're going to be waved through by law enforcement and security. The we-they bias. Now, in the literature, it's called outgroup bias. And it turns out that we all have some conception of our we and everybody else is our they. We are more comfortable with our we than we are with our they. We see more positive characteristics in our we than we do in our they. Now, if you put this on a continuum, we and they, and you go all the way down as far as you can go on the they continuum, what do you have? 
dehumanization, dehumanization. And this brings us to a study by Susan Fisk at Princeton University. Once again, our subjects are in a laboratory setting, sitting in front of a computer screen. Um, but Susan Fisk has uh, hooked them up to an MRI because she wants to see where the brain lights up when she puts certain things on their screen. And one of the things she's putting up is pictures, pictures of human beings that look like you and me. And when these pictures pop up, there's a certain part of the brain that lights up. Uh, Susan Fisk was not the one to identify this. It had been identified previously by researchers. We'll call it the, oh, that's a human just like me part of the brain. It lights up when you look in the mirror and it lights up when you see a human being like you. But what Susan Fisk did is intersperse into those pictures of people that look like you and me, pictures of people who looked homeless, ratty hair, unshaven, uh, ragged clothes. And when those pictures pop popped up, this part of the brain did not light up. The part of the brain that says, oh, that's a human just like me, did not light up. This is a physiological manifestation of society's biases about the homeless. Now, I was going to a summer training. I was going to be training um, officers. They were you know, future police leaders from all over the nation, 99 of them in the room. And I decided this year I was going to implement a new exercise. And I was a little nervous about it. I wasn't sure how it was going to go over. And in small groups, I asked them this question. Do you think that policing as a profession could lead some officers to dehumanize certain groups? And again, I'm not thinking that that happens because they're police. I'm thinking that happens because policing, and you think about what we expose these officers to sometimes over and over and over again. And I wasn't sure how the room would respond. And 100% of those 99 police leaders answered yes. We think policing could lead our officers to dehumanize certain groups. Um, we had a discussion about what are those groups that are most at risk of being dehumanized. But then most importantly, for purposes of takeaway, what is it you can do as police leaders to thwart this, roll it back? You know, What can we do to prevent this dehumanization. So they had some good ideas. Um, one was promote awareness of the risk of dehumanization. This is just you know making it salient. And I'm really glad you know we incorporated this concept into our most recent revision to our training so that we you know raise the idea in these cops' minds is you know you're at risk for this. Your profession puts you at risk for dehumanizing certain groups, and that's a form of bias. Um, another idea: expose those officers to those at-risk groups of being dehumanized, of course, in a positive context, rotate geographical assignment. And so they're not you know, seeing the same you know, woes of humanity over and over again. And then we had a very in interesting discussion on language. Because in police agencies, it often is the case that groups get certain labels, dehumanizing labels, I would argue, crackheads, scum. This NHI, um, the agency swears it's not used anymore. Um, officers would get dispatched to a call. They would show up at the call and over the radio, they would report NHI. And what that meant was that was short for no humans involved. Didn't mean that the offenders had left the scene. Didn't mean they were dealing with a stray dog. It meant the people they were dealing with were something less than human. Language matters, and the language of leaders matters. So three types of biases that I've shared, implicit associations, attention bias, and outgroup bias. So this is part of what we share in our fair and impartial policing training program. We are the number one provider of implicit bias training in North America. We had our first training in 2008, again, before implicit bias was a household term. We do very small agencies like university police, medium, and then some of the largest cities, Boston, Dallas, Miami-Dade. We just finished earlier this year in 
2020, um, two year plus program to train all 36,000 sworn personnel in New York City. We've been highlighted twice in the uh, Police Chief Magazine, which is the periodical of police chiefs, twice in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Gazette, and then in some lay periodicals, Psych Today, Harvard Business Review, CBS Sunday Morning, The News Hour, New York Times, and so forth. Now, it's not always an easy task. Now, I have uh, 23 trainers, and I'm the only trainer that is not sworn law enforcement. My other trainers are either current law enforcement or recently retired. Very important for credibility. No patrol officer with eight years on wants an academic standing at the front of the room talking to them about their biases. But nonetheless, picture my trainers walking into a group. Let's say we've got 25 sergeants. They've got 15, 18 years on. They're sitting there and they know they're going to a fair and impartial policing training. What do you suppose that reception looks like for my trainer? You know, it's something like that. Our audiences are frequently, wherever we go, somewhere between defensive and outright hostile. And I totally understand this. It's the, because of the way we've treated officers and talked to officers about bias for many years, treating them in terms of the traditional notions of uh, bias and prejudice, treating them all like they're racist. So I understand the defensiveness, but it's there. So one of my favorite stories of the transformation um, comes from a North Carolina sergeant. And we get this transformation because we go in there and we say, we're gonna talk to you about you know, human biases. It's not the science of police bias. It's the science of human bias. We're gonna tell you how your mind can play tricks on you and lead you to be unsafe, ineffective and unjust. So this North Carolina sergeant had gone to traditional racial profiling training about a month earlier. Somebody probably stood at the front of the room and shaked his, her finger and said, you know, stop being prejudiced. Then he gets the email from his agency's leadership. And he's told, not only are you going to fair and impartial policing training, you're going to the train the trainer class because you're going to turn around and train the rest of the agency in this content. So this is the email we got from this sergeant after the training. I wanted nothing to do with FIP or its philosophy. As fate would have it, I was handpicked to attend the train the officer classes and forced to go after presenting every possible excuse I could come up with. I came in Monday as opposed and defensive as I could covertly be without getting into trouble, bless his heart, Took about two hours and I was sold on the theory of the class and wondering why I had not been through this training sooner. And indeed, we make the sale, I would say 95 to 99% of the time. In my 12 years of being a police officer, I can honestly say that this was by far the best training I've received to help me do my job better, safer, and serve my community better. I came into this class against my will. My mind was quickly changed from this class is a waste of time to why have I not had this class sooner in my 20 years of service? I love that this class is not about how cops are bad. It was about recognizing problems and how to fix them. Absolutely relevant and essential subject matter for the police world. Powerful material and applications for everyday use on and off duty. So the key components, um, talk about the science of implicit bias, various versions of bias, how implicit bias might manifest in law enforcement, the consequences of biased law enforcement for the individual on the receiving end, the community, the officer, ineffective, unsafe, unjust, and the agency. And then really importantly, skills for producing impartial policing. And it's because of bullet number four that we have different versions because the skills for the patrol officers are different than the skills for the first line supervisors, mid-level managers, and command level personnel. For the patrol officers, and I've highlighted the first three because we're gonna come back to these three. Reduce your biases, manage your biases, beware of other people's biases. We also share reduce ambiguity by slowing it down when feasible. 
Know your agency's bias-free policing policy. Analyze your options with a fair and impartial policing lens. Let's go to one, two, and three, and this is relevant to you. So reducing and managing biases are in fact different mechanisms. I have a black threat implicit association. Many in our society do, by the way. So I have a black threat implicit bias. So in terms of reducing biases, that means I am trying to weaken the uh, association between the two. Maybe it doesn't pop into my head. Um, I call it my blink response. Maybe my black crime blink response doesn't pop into my head as often or as strongly. So reducing it. Now, of course, ideally I'd want to eliminate it, but let's be realistic. It took us a lifetime to develop our associations. They're not going away soon. So that's reducing. Managing says, all right, I've got a black threat implicit association. I'm going to thwart the application of that association on my behavior. So in terms of reducing biases, there's various mechanisms produced by the science uh, for reducing your biases. And one is the contact theory. And this is not going to be new to anybody out there. Maybe a new name, but not a new concept. Because this is science, but it's not rocket science. Contact theory, an individual's biases can be reduced through positive contact with members of other groups, right? You knew that. So my example that I give, um, when I lived in Tallahassee going to Florida State, that's an urban campus. And there were a lot of homeless around. And when I saw the homeless, my blink response was, they're gonna hurt me, they're gonna hurt me. And then I started volunteering at the homeless shelter. I was going every Friday night. I'm the one handing out the toothbrushes and the towels and I made, oh, I brought movies every Friday night. So I'm forming relationships. I'm having a wonderful time. I'm enjoying my interaction with this group that previously um, was mysterious and frightened me. And I did that for virtually every Friday for seven years. And that experience has had impacted me to this day both in terms of my attitudes about the homeless, as well as my blink response, my implicit associations. Contact theory. Managing your biases. Because we're not gonna get our biases to zero, we can manage them immediately. And it comes in three elements, if you will. If we are aware of our implicit biases and we are motivated, we can choose to implement bias-free behavior. Going back to number one, I've said that these implicit biases can impact us outside of conscious awareness. But once I learned about this concept, I started to recognize how many times every day I drew conclusions about people or situations based on my implicit biases. So we can start to recognize them and that's my wish for you. Number two, and we are motivated. The bad news before was implicit associations impact even those individuals who at the conscious level reject biases, stereotypes, and prejudice. If that's you, that's bullet number two. Bullet number three, if I'm aware of my implicit bias and I'm motivated, I can choose to implement bias-free behavior. My black crime implicit association, when I roll into some gas stations in Tampa and there are black males around, I have my blank response. It is not gone yet, despite my many efforts. But now I recognize, I know what's happened to me. I scan the horizon. If I don't see any danger, I go about my business. I'm aware of my implicit bias. I'm motivated. I don't let it impact on my behavior. You want to show your supervisor? Sorry, I was going to introduce that. So this is Mike, um, a police officer, managing his implicit bias. You want to show your supervisors that you're able to go out there on your own and tackle that responsibility that's given to you and also um, go out there and be uh, proactive in uh, policing. Uh, so a bias I have um, is towards, I guess, younger males uh, who are fully tattooed driving the uh, fancy cars um, downtown one night, uh, just on routine patrol and uh, stopped at a red light. I look over to the uh, right side and I see a young male hat on backwards, full tattoos on his neck um, driving. I can't remember what the vehicle was, but it was fancy. And my first thought is, you know what, this guy totally fits the... Um, the, uh, the appearance of a drug dealer. And you know what, maybe I should try and identify this guy and see who he is and what he's up to. 
Um, but then also in the back of my mind is I've just made a, a judge. I've made a single appearance judgment and I don't really have any grounds to stop this mail. So I think, what are my grounds to stop this mail? I've just made a judgment on his appearance and the type of car he's driving. Uh, he hasn't broken the law or done anything to raise my suspicion. It's just completely on his appearance. So as a police officer, we walk a very thin line in this profession. We will have a lot of biases with each situation due to your background or your upbringing. Being able to keep those biases in check and working in an impartial manner will be key to a successful career. So we're working through the uh, three of the skills the, for patrol officers. And number three is beware of other people's biases. That includes profiling by proxy, and I'm gonna come back to that. The other thing we talk about is being attuned to the potential that your colleague is engaging in biased behavior and how might you intervene. But profiling by proxy, this is when a community member calls the police based on his or her biases. And you guys probably watch the news, and so you've heard a many of these stories. They've been highlighted in particular last few years, barbecuing while black, babysitting while Muslim. The COVID version early on when masks were not as prolific as um, they are now, um, police would get calls, hey, there is a black man in Walmart, you know, wearing a mask over his face. I'm sure he's up to no good. All right, so that's profiling by proxy. Now, this is a, a puts police in a very difficult situation. In fact, to show that, this is a scenario that we give to our small groups in all levels of our training. A white woman in an all-white neighborhood calls 911 to report a suspicious man in a car out in front of her house. It appears that the only thing that is suspicious is that the man is Hispanic. She is unable to articulate or identify any behaviors that indicate criminal activity. So whatever level we're training, the trainees are told to identify three possible options and the pros and cons of each. Um, and we don't end the discussion by saying, you know, we're going to tell you what's the right answer, because this is a really difficult situation. I would argue there is no one right answer, but this is the process we want patrol officers and sergeants to go through. Don't just do what the woman wants you to do because she thinks this is a suspicious person. Think about the various responses. Think about the pros and cons. Think about the perspective of the man in the car. This might be the third time this week this Hispanic has had a smiling cop come over and ask him how he's doing. Um, so again, this is very important that cops be thinking about this and community members. Before you pick up 911, stop and think, you know, do I see criminal behavior? Do I see criminal behavior? Now we're on to the first line supervisor. They have to learn all the skills that we just talked about for the patrol officers, but then also how to supervise to promote fair and impartial policing. So their training, how does bias manifest in well-intentioned people? How to identify officers who are manifesting bias? What are they looking for in their direct reports so that they can keep an eye out for potential bias behavior? What do you do when you find it? Or more realistically, when you think you found it? Because it turns out it's not that easy to know when someone's acting on their biases. How might bias is manifesting your own decisions as a supervisor, and then how to talk about bias with individuals, such as your officers, such as community members, community groups, and so forth. Now, the command level training is actually the longest session. Um, the other trainings I've just described are a day long, and the command level is a day and a half. Because the important lesson here is that for the leadership in a police agency, Producing impartial policing is about a lot more than just providing implicit bias training to your personnel. They have to be thinking about higher level processes and how they weave their aspirations for fair and impartial policing into them. So we talk about recruitment, hiring, and promotion. For a bias-free policing policy, training, leadership, supervision, and accountability, measurement, operations and outreach. All of those focused on how do we take these processes and gear them towards this aspiration. And then of course, you know, our other programs are, you know, have the greatest value with it, well-intentioned officers who want to do the right thing. These leadership 
individuals need to be thinking not just about their well-intentioned officers, but what about the folks with traditional forms of bias? What about racists? We have them in all professions. We have them in policing. And how are they going to uh, try not to hire them, identify them if they do, and hold them to account? So let me finish up with fact and fiction. And again, the summer of 2020 has brought a lot of attention to police reform, including implicit bias training. Um, there's been media coverage that includes facts and includes fictions and sometimes includes both. All right, fiction. The science supporting the existence of implicit bias is not strong. This is just wrong. Um, there are decades of science supporting the existence of bias. It is a voluminous literature. Now, mind you, there are debates within this scientific literature. When and how does implicit bias impact behavior? Which of the debiasing skills is effective? Um, but the existence of implicit bias is not doubted within the scientific community. Now, those who raise this fiction, this is generally how they organize their argument. They focus on the Harvard Implicit Association Test, or IAT. You've probably heard of it. In fact, if you Google Harvard IAT, you can actually take some implicit association tests. I recommend weapons and race. Um, and these critics say the reliability and the validity of the IAT has been challenged, and therefore, the whole science is you know, on a faulty base. Well, the problem is, the implicit association test is just one of many ways to measure implicit bias. It just happens to be the most well-known. So the science supporting the existence of implicit bias is strong. Fiction. The objective implicit bias training is to eliminate bias. So generally this comes up in this way. The media says there's really no evidence in the science that this training could ever work. And then they go on to interview the scientists who, who say the truth, which is it's nearly impossible to eliminate biases. And that's true. It's nearly impossible to eliminate biases. But the problem with this so-called journalism is that it's not the goal of implicit bias training to eliminate bias. I mean, that would be a total misreading of the science to design a program that you thought was going to eliminate it. You know, I, as I've shared, we do convey bias reducing skills, but remember my example I gave is a seven years where I was around a group that previously frightened me. So again, we're not saying it's quick or easy. Mostly, mostly FIP is about awareness, bias awareness and bias management. Fiction, implicit bias training produces a backlash in trainees. The claim is this, Implicit bias training makes racist attitudes and or biased behavior worse, not better. Now, this claim, to its credit, I guess, is based on science because there are some studies out there where the researchers directed their subjects to repress their biases, you know, pretend they're not there, you know, ignore your race crime implicit bias. And when they do that, the racist attitudes and the discriminatory behavior attitude increases. But here's the problem with that claim. Implicit bias training does not direct people to repress their biases. It promotes awareness of their biases. It says tune into them, don't suppress them. Fiction. There's no evidence that implicit bias training is effective. This is wrong. And this, this first two slides is about research more generally, not on police audiences with implicit bias training, but other audiences. And when they do random assignment and compare people who received implicit bias training to a control group, they find that the implicit bias trainees are more aware of biases, more concerned about discrimination, have increased motivation to behave in a bias-free manner, they convey intention to use bias reducing and bias managing skills. And this research shows a reduction in bias behavior. Just one example of a study showing reductions in bias behavior, um, randomly assigning university science departments to either receive implicit bias training or not receive it. And the departments that receive the implicit bias training over time hired significantly more women and racial ethnic minorities. 
Now, there has been an evaluation of implicit bias training for police. It was conducted in the context of our provision of the training to the 36,000 New York sworn personnel. And again, they randomly assigned and the implicit bias trainees compared to the control group were more likely to recognize bias policing as a legitimate public concern. They were more concerned about discrimination as a social problem, more motivated to act in an unbiased way, which goes along with indicating their commitment to use the fair and impartial policing skills, more likely to recognize how implicit bias can impact on police professionals. Now, the researchers did attempt to identify behavior changes in the field that could be directly linked to fair and impartial policing, and they did not detect those changes. Um, they did not claim that that means that it does not impact on behavior. They did not make that claim at all, that implicit bias training does not impact on behavior. They talked about the challenge of trying to measure this, even with a high quality study. They said, estimating the effect of a single training curriculum on officers' decisions may well be akin to finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. And they went on to say that finding that needle is even more challenging when they're testing within an agency that's not just undergoing one change, implicit bias training, but undergoing multiple changes directed towards the same objective at the same time. And that was the case with NYPD. This all came on the heels of the stop and frisk controversy. They had implemented, you, can, you know, the report list four, five, six different interventions, including implicit bias training. And so it's very hard to detect our impact. Fact, implicit bias training for police is not the silver bullet. You know, this is indirectly the, comes out of this summer where the claim was, well, hey, if implicit bias training worked, bias and abusive behavior on the part of police would disappear. The context was this summer, well, hey, some of these departments, you know, they've had implicit bias training. How come they're not all angels? All right. Well, Neither the science of bias education or our understanding of human frailties would support that claim. And it, first of all, it's not a one-off kind of a training, but also implicit bias training is a necessary component of multi-dimensional efforts. I mentioned that in the context of the command level training. It's not just about implicit bias training. It's about hiring and recruitment and culture and the leadership message. And it's also about our society. Police don't, aren't in a vacuum. We recruit, we hire from a society that has biases. So that needs to be our focus as well. Fact, implicit bias training will not cure a racist cop of animus towards minority groups. It will, however, inform the police officer of good intentions that every police officer is part of the problem of bias policing, but also a significant part of the solution. Thank you very much.